everybody. Welcome to this Sunday evening meeting of the Lighthouse Baptist Church. Let's take a hymn we'll on stand, please, and turn to hymn number 245. That's 245, hymn 245. There was a time on earth when in the book of heaven an old account was standing. Let's sing together hymn 245. There was a time on earth when in the book of heaven an old account was standing. For sin should unforgive, my name was at the top. Dear gracious Father, thank you so much, Lord, for this uh, beautiful day that you've given us, Lord. Thank you for allowing us to be here tonight. And, Father, we just pray that you'll uh, uh, be with each one of us, Lord, and just uh, pray that you'll be with uh, Brother Hatfield, Lord, as he brings a message tonight. And, Father, I just uh, thank you and ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You can be seated. Give you a couple of quick announcements and then turn it back over to Brother Derek. Uh, of course, again, uh, Next Sunday, the 19th, is uh, Father's Day. Uh, and then we got uh, the 26th, we got uh, Evangelist Craig Davidson coming in. And then also that night, we have our uh, ice cream social. And then July 18th is the 22nd is our VBS. Uh, then our notebook drive right after VBS on July 30th for that. And let's see, his birthday was Miss Kyla today, June 14th. It's her birthday. Yeah, June 14th. Today's the 12th. So Tuesday. Awesome. How old will you be, Kyla? Eight? Man, you told me this morning you wasn't becoming an old lady. You're not? That's eight. That's getting pretty old. All right. I guess that's it. Let's take a hymn. Let's stand again. Let's turn hymn number 39. Hymn 39. How beautiful heaven must be. Amen. In 39, we read of a place, let's sing together. We read of a place that's called heaven. It's made for the pure and the free. These truths are God's word he hath given. How beautiful heaven must be. How beautiful heaven must be. Sweet home of the happy and free. Fair haven of rest for the weary. Beautiful heaven must be in heaven, no oh, grouping. 
tonight. Appreciate that. Well, I guess Brother Hatfield will just get you to come on up and turn it over to you. I'll let you tear into us tonight. Thank Thomas. you for having me, Brother Thank Roger. You, brother. Well, if you get around Lighthouse, you fall in love with the people. And my heart goes out to you. I was sitting over there thinking, I want to compliment you on your song service. Uh, the screen is up like many churches are doing now, but they get rid of their hymnals. And you've kept your hymnal. And I like that. I stand for old time salvation, old time worship, old time religion. My papa had it right. He preached 43 years and the Lord took him home with cancer and pastored nine churches in those 43 years. Three of them he pastored on two occasions. Could not read, could not write. But God used him. I seen my grandmother sit at the table throughout the week and read his verse to him over and over. And he would have it memorized. He would open his Bible, get up and act like he was reading. And sometimes he'd leave words out or add words. But about three seconds into his message, you knew the anointing of God was on that old man. I remember when I announced my call to preach, he sent for me, laying on his deathbed with cancer. I said, so you going to preach, huh, boy? I said, yes, sir, pap, I'm going to preach. He said, get down here beside me. I knelt down by his bed. He laid his hand on top of my head, began to pray. He said, Lord, let him go where I always wanted to go. Let him preach what I always wanted to preach. Let him do what I always wanted to do. And every time I go into a new church like this, I think about that prayer that I'm representing the Lord Jesus Christ, but there's a little bit of pearl tinker in me too. And if you take his photograph and put it beside me, you'd almost swear it's me. His daughter, my aunt, his youngest daughter, came to hear me preach down in Fort Payne, Alabama. And she walked in. It had been a few years since we had seen one another, and she just froze. She said, I can't believe you. You're just like Betty. So I, I think that's a great compliment. I'm glad to be here, and I appreciate you coming out on a hot and humid evening to the house of God. We're going back to the book of John again tonight. This evening we'll be in chapter 1 of the book of John, and I want to read just one verse to you. That'll be verse number 14. And pray for us this week. I'll be up here in Smithville at um, a camp meeting with Brother Orville Duncan, Good Shepherd Baptist Church. And we'll be there through Thursday night. I told Brother Roger and Brother Dave that I would Keep my ears open for somebody looking for a church. There'll be probably a, around 70 preachers there this week. And maybe that man will be there and we'll be able to meet him and put him in 
contact with you. Oh, I'm, I've got you on my prayer list and praying that God will raise up that man for you. You deserve a pastor. And I hope he'll come and spend the rest of his life with you and win this community to God. I've done evangelism most all my life. I pastored Lakeview Baptist Church in Hollywood, Alabama. <laughs> uh, but we had a great ministry. Uh, I enjoyed pastoring because I got to know people. I got to see the struggles they have, the mountaintops they experience, and it gave me a great insight of my preaching. And uh, we were there three and a half years, and the first Sunday we had 18. When I left, we run 123 in Sunday school. I baptized 66 in a three and a half years. And I pray God will raise up that kind of man for you. Look in your Bible at John chapter 1, verse number 14. If you will, I know you stand singing, but I'll ask you to stand while I read my Bible. John chapter 1, look at verse 14. Get my eyes open. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Let's bow for prayer. Father, again this evening we ask for your help in this time of preaching. Lord, there have been times that I've stood and tried to preach by myself and it never works out so I yield myself to you take my thoughts and my voice and preach through us the preaching that you would will I pray Father you'd help us to say only those things that would be pleasing to you Speak to everyone under the sound of my voice. Do a work in each heart. We'll thank you. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. <clears throat> the Word was made flesh. And I love that statement, dwelt among us. We are what we are because God manifested himself and came where we was. In your Bible, you have two fights. The first fight is in Genesis chapter 3 in the Garden of Eden. And Satan comes in the form of a serpent and beguiles Eve. That word beguile means he was bigger than her, he was stronger than her, and he was wiser than she was. Eve never had a prayer within herself. She was beguiled. It would be like a ninth grader picking on a third grader. There just wouldn't be a fight to it. It would be over quickly. And Eve had one uh, tool that she could utilize, and that was the Word of God. And 
the Bible said in the cool of the evening or the cool of the day, God came walking, the voice of God came walking in the garden. It was God coming to Adam and Eve. And I would have loved to hid in the bushes and seen what they did. How that God had a time of fellowship with man and with woman. It was paradise. Everything was perfect. There was only one rule. And the rule was do not eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Then comes the Satan in the form of a serpent, and a battle forms between Eve and Satan. And Satan said, Ye shall not surely die. For in the day that you eat thereof, Ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Well, that should have sold itself. Why would you want to know evil to start with? And you've got to realize Eve was not as we are. She was innocent. She had no sin. And any time that the devil comes in the garden. All Eve had to do was allow the voice of God to answer his accusation. But instead of allowing God to answer Satan, Eve said, I can handle this myself. And so the battle formed. And Eve quoting God. But if you look in Genesis chapter 3, you will find out that she added some words. When you add to this Bible, you make it of none effect. So her power was of no use to her. All she had to do was let God fight the battle. But she thought within herself, I can handle this. If you come several years down through time, that is still our problem today. We think we can handle the devil. We allow these battles to form between us and Satan. But if she fell from innocence, who are we to think we can win the battle in corruption? The second battle that you find in your Bible is found in Matthew chapter 4. And verse 1 says, Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. One knucklehead wrote a book. And in the book said, Could Jesus have sinned? Well, I want to answer that tonight. No, no, a thousand times no. You say, well, the devil didn't have a chance then. You're getting the message. He was doomed before the battle started. But I found in my Bible when it said the word was made flesh. There's actually two flesh in the Bible. 
There is the innocent flesh of the Garden of Eden, and there is the corrupted flesh of fallen man. And I ask myself this question, which one of those two flesh did the Word become? He said He dwelt among us and were corrupted. But what about the, the Word? Which one of those flesh did He become? Well, folks, I can think of no greater way to answer a Bible question than allow the Bible to be your source. It answers all questions. Turn with me, if you will, to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2 and verse 27. This is the answer of which one of those two flesh did the Word become? Now you may ask the question, does it matter? Oh, it matters. Because which one of those two flesh he becomes determines where he goes. And it also determines what he's fighting for. And in Acts chapter 2, verse 27, look at it. Because thou will not leave my soul in hell, neither will thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Look at verse 31. He's seen this before, spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. So the Bible answered my question. He became the innocent flesh of the garden of Eden. And there is a reason for that. If there had been a commentator at that first fight, he would have said, in the black ring, we have Satan. And in the white ring, we have Eden. And the bell is going to ring. Ding, ding. They come out of their corner. They meet in center ring. And the devil throws the first punch by saying, Ye shall not surely die. Or in other words, God lied to you. And doubt settles in. That is the devil landing his punch on the chin. And Eve goes down. She loses the fight. Adam gets involved. And the Bible says she did eat of the fruit and gave to her husband. And he did eat, and the eyes of them both were open, knowing good and evil. Adam lost that battle. If you read through the New Testament, it's not Eve that God holds accountable, but it's Adam that he holds accountable for the fight. They lost. They had to leave the garden. And the loser of the fight always leaves the ring. And Adam and Eve went out into the world 
where there were thorns and thistles, and they had to earn their meat by the sweat of their brow. And it was different. But then the Bible comes thundering out and says the Word was made flesh and He became the innocent flesh of the Garden of Eden. So when Jesus became flesh, He went back to Eden. He found Adam down and bleeding. He lost the realm. And Jesus reached over to Adam and said, Tag, I'll take over from here. I'll take round two. If the Lord would help me a little while, I want to preach a sermon entitled Eden Round Two. Ding, ding. Let's get it on. Yeah, man lost round one, but things are going to be different in Matthew 4. And in Matthew chapter 4, if you want to turn there, I don't apologize for having people to turn through their Bible. I believe God loves the turning of the pages. Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward and hunger. And when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. Now let me tell you about this first punch. It doesn't go very far. And it certainly doesn't land if thou be the Son of God. Command these stones to be made bread. Listen, folks. He's talking to the bread of life. He's telling the bread of life to turn a rock into bread. Jesus could turn anything he wanted into bread. The truth of the matter is, you got yourself a dumb devil. The dumbest of all devils is Satan trying to get the bread of life to turn a stone into bread. But look what Jesus says. I like his answer. It is written. <laughs> you know what that is? It is written. It's Jesus saying to the devil, I'm going to take this right fist and I'm going to make it hit your left jaw and there ain't a thing in the world you can do about it. It is written. In round one, Eve tried to quote God. But this time, the word has his chance to speak up. And he says in verse 4, Man shall not live by bread alone, 
but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. I would love to have been at ringside because that one landed. <laughs> and the devil's knees began to buckle. His eyes rolled back in his head. His strength was gone. And Jesus landed the first punch. Eden, round two. Ding, ding. Let's get it on. Look at verse five. Then the devil taketh him up into the holy city and setteth him on a pinnacle of the temple, and saith unto him, If, again, he used, he didn't learn a single thing, if thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written, <laughs> Now the devil is going to try to quote the word to the word. What a dumb devil. He is nothing. For it is written, he shall give his angels charge concerning me. And in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest it any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. He tries to quote Psalm 91. But if you research it, he is the one that misquotes the word this time. And again, I love Jesus' response. For he said, in verse 7, Jesus said unto him, It is written. Another punch, another land. The devil's knees are buckled even more. His strength is almost gone. He don't even know what his ring, his corner is. He's losing focus. He's like a fighter that has been beaten down on the ground. And the word landed another punch. Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. You talking about a dumb devil. He tries to get the bread of life to turn a rock into bread. And now he's trying to quote the word to the word. He's losing this battle. Verse 8, again the devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain, showeth him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. And saith unto him, All these things will I give thee, if thou wilt fall down and worship me. You're talking about a dumb devil. We got ourselves the dumbest devil of them all. How would you like to have the kingdoms of the world? How would you like to feed Russia right now? I don't believe I want that job. How would you like to inherit America's deficit? I don't believe I want that job. This is not even a temptation. And in verse number 10, Then saith Jesus unto him, Watch this, it's going to be different this time. Get thee hence, Satan, 
For it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Misquoted Psalm 91. The battle has formed between Satan and the Word. And for the third time, Jesus lands his punch and says, it is written. I can only imagine the heartache Satan is trying to get away from. But look at the next verse. Then the devil leaveth him and behold, angels came and ministered unto him. In round one, Adam had to leave the garden. In round two, Satan has to leave the ring. And Jesus stands in center ring. And the Bible says, and angels ministered unto him. Reckon they wiped his blood away? What did them angels do? I believe those angels that ministered to him did it like this. Wow. What a fight. <laughs> Man, we ain't never seen anything like that. Holy, you're the true champion. You are the Lord of Lords and King of Kings. You're God. Wow. We, we will live for eternity. We'll never see another fight like that. They ministered unto him. And here we are several years later. And you have two choices. You can allow the battle to form between yourself and the devil. As a matter of fact, you may be one of those that would say, Brother Hatfield, I would be scared to call the devil dumb. I'm not afraid of him. For my Bible says, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. <laughs> so you can allow those battles to form. Or you can let the word Fight your battles. It's up to you. But you know the only thing you'll have to fight for is the one thing you refuse to put under his authority. You keep it back, reserving one sin that you may dabble in the world in secrecy. Well, I'm here to tell you your future is going to be filled with nothing but battle after battle after battle. You're never going to win. The devil will take you down. He will split your home. He will devastate your testimony. He will ruin everything about you. Or you can take all your life and yield it to the Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> and say, Lord, I'm yours. Take me and use me for your glory. And then every time the devil comes to try to tempt you, 
The word will come where you are and say, tag, I'll take it from here and he'll fight your battle for you. Folks, this Bible cannot be defeated. It's perfect. I have no reservation in standing up here and claiming the word is perfect. I ask people to stand when I read it because it's the only perfect thing left in this world is our Bible. When you read a verse, accept that verse as authority. And yield your members to that verse. And then when the battle comes, Jesus will come where you are and say, Tag, I'll take it from here. Tonight, it's just a little sermon, but a thought to take home with you. Eden, round. Ding, ding. Let's get it on. And the winner of the fight is none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. And everything that he has ever done in my life has made me a better person. The only time that I've ever got in trouble has been when I took something back from him. And I said, I can handle that. I'll take care of it. Eve made that mistake. Let's don't live our lives making the mistake. Because the Christian life is not supposed to be one long battle. It's supposed to be a love story between you and the Word. Let's stand and bow for prayer. You never know what people are going through. There may be someone here tonight that's struggling with their walk with God, about to make a wrong decision, about to go in the wrong direction. How many in this room would just be honest with God and say, Brother Hatfield, God sent the message this evening to me. Would you raise your hand? I needed to hear that. God bless you. Father, thank you for the Bible. Thank you that you've made us what we are tonight. And I pray for everyone that lifted their hand that, Lord, they'll yield their members unto you. And life will be one long love story between them and the Word. Bless this altar. If someone needs to use it tonight, we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.